Oceanography class. Welcome to an online lecture on marine pollution. This is chapter 11. <clears throat> pollution is defined as any harmful substance or even energy that's put into the oceans by humans. Okay, you can clearly see that picture of a beach littered with all kinds of trash. That's non-point uh, pollution. That's a lot of plastics just washing up on the beach. That is one type of pollution, just an, as an example, okay? Pollution is harmful to living organisms, okay? Scientists have developed what we refer to as a standard laboratory biasay, and that is uh, a measurement of any type of pollution. And if the con concentration of that pollutant causes about 50% mortality, amongst a uh, test organism, meaning like any test organism that you're uh, doing the ex experiment on, uh, that's considered um, like the standard, uh, let's say concentration that's allowable in the oceans as a, a pollutant. Okay, and it's really bad. And, and, you know, pollution is a global issue, right? We're realizing that more and more um, given how connected our world is now, given this pandemic that spread like wildfire across the world. Pollution, when it goes into the oceans, our oceans are all connected. It's one world ocean. And if we have a bunch of pollution uh, of different types going into the oceans, it's gonna infect everybody. And pollution is a hindrance to marine activities, recreational activities, to the organisms in the ocean, to humans in the ocean. It reduces the quality of seawater, and uh, yeah, it's not good. An environmental bias A is a technique that uh, scientists use, particularly at the EPA, um, to determine how a, a specific pollutant affects marine organisms. So it can be like a, a fertilizer, um, some sort of chemical, mercury, for example, or a, another pollutant. And Essentially, uh, they conduct experiments with individual organisms and increase the concentration of that pollutant until about 50% of the organism's uh, mortality rate is reached. And that's the pollutant concentration limit that's established, okay? Now that's a pretty <laughs> bad standard given the fact that, you know, it's a 50% mortality rate. So half of the organisms have to die at that concentration of a pollutant for it to be set the standard, the standard, right? So if you're just below that standard, so if 48% of the organisms die, then you're like, well, it's below the standard. <laughs> so there are many drawbacks to this environmental bias A. Um, one is that it, it, it takes into account the um, kind of uh, instantaneous mortality rate of organisms. So it doesn't look at how it affects organisms in the long term. Okay, because maybe at lower concentrations, the mortality rate is lower. However, maybe this pollutant affects the uh, reproductive rates of the organisms um, so that this generation of organisms can no longer reproduce at the same rate as the previous generation. Thus, the future generations will decrease in population as a result of exposure to that uh, pollutant. Okay. Uh, another thing is that in a laboratory setting, you really just test one pollutant at a time. And so uh, it doesn't take into effect the possible other pollutants that are in the water. And that kind of combined effect may, have, may uh, alter an organism's uh, you know, biological functions or reproductive functions, okay? Um, and also these experiments are very time consuming. They take a long time to, uh, to reproduce and they work on one organism at a time. So, one pollutant, let's say a chemical or fertilizer, may affect sea turtles, but um, that same pollutant might not affect tuna. Okay, so if the experiment was done with tuna, the EPA would set the standard saying that, oh, these high concentrations are okay because it doesn't affect tuna. But in reality, it might affect other organisms like sea turtles um, to a greater extent. So there are a lot of drawbacks to this uh, type of uh, experiments and standard setting. Okay, um, <clears throat> for the longest time, there's been a saying uh, amongst uh, amongst people that uh, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? Great rhyming uh, 
group of words, but really uh, the ocean has is, is always been so vast and so big, so no one's really thought that dumping some trash or pollutants into the ocean would have any effect, but what we're realizing now is that with a growing human population and most people living close to the coastal zones, it's starting to have an effect and we can start to measure um, how these pollutants are adversely affecting marine organisms and humans. Okay, um, And there's a lot of debate about it. I mean, it depends on the pollutant. Um, you know, not every pollutant's the same. Uh, but some some oceanographers, actually a lot of oceanographers, say that we shouldn't be polluting polluting the oceans with sewage and uh, all kinds of trash, or not at all. Uh, others say some is okay, depending on the pollutant, but you know that's still uh, debated. But everyone agrees that um, if we're sending out material into the oceans or pollutants, it has to be monitored. Okay. So here are the main types of uh, marine pollution. There's petroleum or oil. Okay, there's sewage sludge. Okay, this is the material um, that's our uh, number one and number two bathroom material. Okay, this this water, uh, sewage water, typically goes to treatment plants. It's uh, chlorinated and filtered, and all the heavy material sinks out of the water, um, and then that's sewage sludge. It's just the um, solid matter from our waste. Okay. Um, then there are uh, DDT is an insecticide. Okay, so that's a chemical. And PCBs, these are uh, in industrial chemicals that we use uh, to create, or we used to use to create uh, refrigerants, and uh, we used in transformers. Okay. Mercury is a very common uh, element. It's a metal that's uh, kind of liquid in. Uh, standard pressures and temperatures, uh, but it's used a lot in different um, uh, industrial uses and also as a byproduct of burning coal, okay? And then non-point source pollution uh, and trash. This is material that can't be traced back directly to a source. Most of the time it's plastics. All right, let's talk about petroleum first. We call it oil. It's actually naturally occurring, okay? Um, it's a liquid made of hydrocarbons, a lot of carbon, lighter hydrogen in it. Essentially, it's the uh, lots of organic matter, typically from marine organisms that, uh, like algae that live on the surface of the ocean, like diatoms, for example. Um, when they die, they accumulate uh, on the surface of the ocean floor. And if enough of, of them accumulate over time and are buried by sediment, um, the organic material can become hydrocarbons, okay? So in terms of marine pollution, it becomes a pollutant when it spills into the ocean and in vast quantities. Most of the time, it's transportation accidents. Sometimes the, the accidents can happen uh, at, from extraction because we go out to uh, kind of uh, offshore platforms and drill wells, and sometimes there can be accidents like explosions The the craziest and greatest example of this was the uh, 2010 Gulf of Mexico Deepwater Horizon blowout. Uh, there's actually a major motion picture uh, on this event, and uh, Mark Wahlberg is the uh, protagonist in that movie. Marky Mark, right? Uh, and other smaller spills occur when uh, large boats that, that uh, transport the oil um, spill some during loading and unloading. Okay, the first you know, major oil spill that occurred and kind of encompassed the consciousness of uh, you know, the human sensationalism on the media and stuff like that was the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And that was in 1989. Um, about 11 million gallons of oil spilled into the beautiful, pristine waters of Prince William Sound, uh, Alaska. Okay, and this area is absolutely beautiful, you know, very untouched, very natural, and this thick crude oil just spilled everywhere. What happened was one of the boats that was leaving uh, Valdez uh, was trying to avoid some icebergs, and they veered off course, and they struck some rocks that were uh, uh, kind of jutting out from the seafloor. Um, and then so all of this crude oil just spilled uh, along about 11 kilometers of coastline in Alaska just caked it in oil. Uh, 
So many of the animals, birds, otters, um, were almost immediately killed as they were covered with oil. Okay, so um, the immediate impacts of oil spills are pretty drastic. And um, if you see the pictures, if you see the media coverage, um, it's sad. Okay, so the immediate impacts are quick and, and devastating. The long-term consequences are kind of unknown. Here's that 11-kilometer part of Alaska. It's essentially right on the border with Canada. This entire area was covered by an oil slick. Okay, here's another image you can see here. Here's a close-up image of the emulsified oil that spilled as this tanker just ruptured and spilled its guts all over the uh, coastal waters. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the Exxon Valdez spill in terms of uh, volume of oil that was leaked into the ocean in, in, in one moment, okay? So, you know, 11 million gallons. There have been other um, kind of uh, single event major oil spills that have been much larger, okay? Uh, 10 years before this, in the Gulf of Campeche, in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of the Yucatan, uh, Ixtoc, the Mexican petroleros uh, had a blowout in one of their wells and about 140 million gallons spilled uh, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, and some of that stuff even made it to Texas at that time. Okay. Um, the Deepwater Horizon blowout, which was that major motion picture, um, <clears throat> uh, this spilled about 206 million gallons into the Gulf of Mexico. This was pretty crazy because this spill um, was really large, unintentional, obviously. The, there was just a huge blowout and the platform kind of collapsed. Um, but every four days, it released an equivalent of the Exxon Valdez spill uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. And that really uh, dirtied a lot of the Gulf Coast beaches in the Panhandle, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, Texas. I mean, you name it. Those The people who live and work there were really affected by this. Um, and what was crazy, too, is at that time, they actually had a camera um, where the uh, blowout occurred underwater. Um, and so in 2010, you could go and, and go to the live stream of this oil just spilling into the Gulf of Mexico, which is pretty crazy. And they ended up um, capping that, uh, that blowout, that blowed up well, uh, using uh, submersibles and robotics to do that, which was pretty crazy. Okay, another, um, this was a, a, an intentional release of oil uh, into the ocean as a result of the Persian Gulf War. Uh, what happened here is uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Kuwait's this tiny little country um, that, uh, you know, the spare of the history lesson was part of Iraq at one point, but then U.S. intervention, it became its own country, really close to the Persian Gulf, very tiny, uh, very oil rich. Okay, so... Uh, Saddam Hussein came in and kind of uh, invaded um, uh, Kuwait, and that's what started uh, the Persian Gulf War. Um, and so uh, when the U.S. went to, uh, to Kuwait and uh, kind of kick out the, uh, the Iraqi soldiers, um, like a scorned lover, they essentially just lit the wells on fire. Um, and so they intentionally spilled uh, oil into the Gulf and also blew out a lot of the wells, uh, which is pretty crazy. So this released a lot of oil into the environment. <clears throat> but it's worth noting um, that oil seeping into the ocean is actually a natural process. We call it natural seepage. Um, and this is the estimate right here of how much oil is released into the ocean naturally. Like if you go to the, the bottom of the sea floor, especially around the Gulf Coast, oil just comes, uh, like, just spits out um, out of the bottom of the sea floor. That happens naturally. Um, but the difference is, is these are, you know, these spills occurred in one small area, uh, you know, in, in, in the ocean. So it had a dramatic effect on the local organisms. But this is just, you know, drops being emitted in many different parts of the world's oceans. So in an entire year, natural seepage accounts for about how much oil was released from the deep water horizon. But again, this occurs naturally. And when it, when it occurs like this, it's just really small amounts in different parts of the ocean all over the place. And that allows the bacteria to kind of break it down and so that it doesn't affect marine organisms as much.
Okay. U.S. waters alone is uh, a lot. We have a huge continental shelf that has got a lot of oil in it. Okay. So here's Kuwait. This was in 1991. So there was a lot. This here's the entire kind of extent of that oil slick that was released into the Persian Gulf, which was a shame. Uh, some of these areas have a beautiful coral reefs. Uh, you can see this guy's dipping his fingers covered in crude oil. Uh, but, but yeah, about 240 million gallons uh, was spilled into the Persian Gulf, as well as uh, there were fires that, uh, that lit up and blackened the sky, which is pretty crazy. Okay, um, and that was 20 times the amount of Exxon Valdez. Okay, here's the, the deep water horizon. This is where Marky Mark, you know, courageously jumped into the water after the explosion. Okay, but um, this was one of the platforms off the coast of uh, Louisiana right here. And uh, there was an explosion. Um, and afterwards they realized it was mostly due to negligence. Uh, BP's taking responsibility for it. Um, and uh, this oil slick covered a lot of the Gulf Coast communities here killed the fishing industry in a lot of these places. Florida is dependent on a lot of tourism and oil was just washing up ashore uh, in these areas. So that spilled about 206 million gallons of oil. And that's in, in our own waters here in the US. Okay. Then here's the Ishtuk one. Uh, this occurred right here, see, really close to uh, the Yucatan. And uh, this oil slick kind of traveled all the way to spring break spots like South Padre Island, Brownsville, Texas. Uh, it's pretty crazy, 530 million liters. Okay, this didn't receive as much media coverage uh, like the Exxon Valdez, Valdez spill, um, but still a very notable, large, uh, unintentional oil spill. Okay, so petroleum really, um, it's made up of a lot of hydrocarbons and that's a, a natural substance that, that occurs in the oceans on continental shelves naturally, okay? So it's organic. And what that means is that it can be biodegraded, meaning that, uh, you know, small bacteria actually can break it down. So when oil enters into the ocean, it's a natural process and the microbes get into it and break it down. So when it occurs in small frequent kind of releases like natural seeps, seeps um, this is completely normal, okay? Um, however, when it, <clears throat> It goes into the ocean via those major oil spills, the effects on marine organisms is drastic in the short term. Okay, the long term, we don't really know that much. But it's because petroleum is a toxic compound. It contains a lot of different chemicals in it. It's like a big mix of different chemicals. One of the worst ones is uh, PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, and this has been shown to change the gene expression uh, in organisms, so cause mutations, that's not good. Also lower fertility rates, that's not good. Um, it sickens humans and animals, okay? Um, and they can have long-term impacts on organisms. They can develop abnormalities if you're exposed to PAHs for too long and decrease uh, embryo survival. That's not good. All right, and then uh, I'm sure you can Google the Exxon Valdez spill. There are a lot of pictures um, from that time showing uh, a lot of the marine birds that were affected by the crude oil. Um, here, this is a pelican just covered in the oil, uh, really devastating. Um, what happens is when they're covered by that oil, um, their feathers are no longer as, uh, they don't insulate their bodies as well. So overnight, these birds basically just froze and, and, and cooled down to death because they were just covered in that oil. Okay, caused really high fatality rates in marine birds. Okay, but it's a short-term um, effect. So here are th three different organisms that exist off the coast of Alaska. Um, and as a result of that oil spill, which was devastating, um, populations of the bald eagle decreased rapidly from 89 to 1990. So did, the, so did cormorants and harbor seals. And the Pacific herring actually saw an increase uh, in, in uh, population. Um, but this is the immediate effect. This is within one year, okay? And then after uh, one year, the populations actually rebounded very, fairly quickly, okay? Um, bald eagles uh, increased drastically, um, and so did the Pacific herring, okay? The uh, kind of collapse of the Pacific herring uh, in 1993 was associated with a disease 
so it was unrelated to the oil spill. But um, you know, after uh, the oil spills, there's kind of an immediate effect on marine organisms, but they typically bounce back fairly quickly after a few years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Oil spills, even though those are kind of drastic one-time uh, events that occur in the ocean and are devastating to that local area, uh, if you add up all the oil being spilled into the ocean, that's not the primary source of all the oil. Okay, um, when you look at human sources in the ocean, which makes up more than half of all the oil in the ocean, um, it's mostly petroleum consumption. This is us guys driving our cars, uh, boats, cruise ships, spilling uh, you know uh, oil onto the street and that runs off into the ocean that's most of it extraction and wells blowing out and spilling that occurs that's only about six percent and then this is transportation about 22 percent so that's the oil tankers uh, and the spilling that occurs there okay so most of the petroleum in the oceans is because of us we're guilty um, but and it's, and it's really small, but very frequent oil releases that it contributes to uh, us right here, 53%. Okay. Now, the cleaning of oil spills, it, 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 we've learned a lot since the Exxon Valdez spill. Um, when that happened, um, what they did, and same with the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010, um, what a lot of the uh, oil companies paid for was to go out and dump chemicals on top of the oil slick. Okay, so here's the oil slick. They would dump dispersants. And what dispersants do is just spread the oil out so it doesn't, like, thicken up. Now, so that doesn't really, like, clean it up. That just kind of dilutes it and spreads it out. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> what they found was that wasn't really particularly effective. Um, in Alaska, during the Exxon Valdez spill, uh, some of the people on the ground went out and started essentially like using um, pressure washers, really hot water, to kind of disperse the oil uh, right on the coastline. Um, and that looked great, uh, but it actually killed a lot of the marine organisms like the mollusks and the barnacles that existed on the rocks. And areas that weren't treated in that fashion with dispersants or really hot water actually recovered slower than areas that were just completely left alone. So what happens is oil, because it's a natural substance, microbes will get, get to it and break it down and clean it up eventually. Um, so weirdly or oddly enough, leaving the oil alone is actually a better process than actually trying to actively clean it up. I mean, obviously, like, what happens with oil is when you initially uh, spill it, it, it floats because its density is less than that of water, okay? Then a lot of the volatiles evaporate away, okay? It photooxidizes and it goes into the atmosphere. And so what happens there is it begins to emulsify, okay? Um, and it thickens into this thick kind of uh, uh, oily substance. This can be cleaned up, it can be skimmed out, and that's a good way of cleaning it up. Um, otherwise, it gets... Uh, it gets too heavy and then starts to sink uh, and goes right back and deposits on the ocean floor where it'll be uh, degraded or biodegraded by microbes. Okay, When it mixes around a lot uh, because of ocean currents and wind, it turns into this kind of thick mousse, which is pretty gross. Okay, But essentially it spreads around. Um, here's This is an oil reservoir and a natural seep. Okay, And so this is how it, it's really slowly into the ocean and allows for biodegradation to occur. Okay. So yeah, we can skim it, uh, but ultimately bioremediation is the best method in uh, cleaning up oil spills like this. Okay, um, and that's the use of bacteria or fungus to clean up those oil spills. So what we can do is actively release bacteria into these areas uh, and help them concentrate around the oil spills to break it down faster, and that's proven to work really well. Another method is like... Um, introducing fertilizers that are favorable for bacterial growth into these areas, and that has shown to accelerate the um, breakdown uh, of oil naturally, and that really st stimulates the growth of that degrading bacteria. All right, so that what we've the research that's been poured into this area has really found that bioremediation is really the best way to do it. Okay, so since um, the Exxon Valdez spill in 1989, 
there were a number of um, legislative legislative acts that were passed uh, that were very important. All the new tankers had to be double hold instead of single hold. What that essentially means is is there's a second layer of protection. So if a boat ever runs aground again, it might pierce the first hole, but it might not get to the second hole where the where the oil is stored. And in addition to that, now the oil tankers have to have multiple compartments. So even if it runs aground and the second hole is pierced, only a portion of the oil would spill into the ocean rather than the entire tanker. Okay, so that is really redesigning ships. Okay, one really crazy example uh, of an oil spill was um, a Japanese tanker that was off the coast of uh, Oregon. And what happened here was it kind of ran aground and <clears throat> uh, it, it was kind of getting pushed by the ocean onto the land and was starting to spill oil. So what they decided to do was to uh, light it a fire to, to just burn the oil off and let that stuff go into the atmosphere rather than let it spill on the coastline of Oregon. Okay. Uh, eventually that fire kind of, kind of split the, the Japanese tanker in half and there was a spill, but they estimated that they uh, prevented about half of the oil from spilling onto uh, the Oregon coast. And then what was pretty crazy, then they towed the boat out uh, to deeper waters and then they sank it with a torpedo which is pretty cool. So that was an intentional burn to prevent um, kind of a larger oil spill. All right, let's move on to sewage sludge. All right, so that's that semi-solid material uh, after treatment, of course. So all the uh, toilet bowl washing uh, or flushing that we're doing, all that wastewater then goes to um, uh, wastewater treatment facilities. Human waste, oils in copper, lead, silver, mercury, pesticides, all that stuff becomes uh, kind of uh, emulsified in this material, solid material, okay? That's the sewage sludge, okay? So the primary treatment, those solids are allowed to settle. Secondary treatment, it's exposed to bacteria killing chlorine, okay? So uh, we used to dump a lot of our sewage sludge just directly into the ocean, just right into harbors, right into coastal waters. Um, and that, that, you know, solved the problem back in that time uh, but uh, what ended up happening is people like to go to the coast and the beaches to, uh, you know, have do recreational activities and enjoy um, the fun. But uh, once the sewage smell started washing ashore, people realized this could be a problem. Uh, diseases could be spread that way. Um, so <clears throat> after 1981, there wasn't you you weren't allowed to dump uh, sludge into the ocean after that. Uh, because of the Clean Water Act in 1972. But uh, they ran into problems. It became really expensive to dump the, the solid waste onto land. So there were a lot of waivers and exceptions. So into the 80s, this continued to happen for a while. Okay. Uh, in New York, okay, very big city, lots of uh, sludge being created there. This is where their initial sites were, one and two. Okay. Um, and this was done in um, water that was uh, shallower than 40 meters. Okay, that's pretty shallow. So what would happen is a lot of this material would would be pushed towards land because of the incoming tides, um, and that caused problems. It made the water quality pretty pretty terrible uh, on the coast of New Jersey and New York. Okay, um, so in 1986 they decided to change that and have their dumping sites all the way out here. This is the dumping site number four. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, but again, this is in deeper water, so beyond about a kilometer of depth, but still, uh, commercial fisheries started complaining that they were, uh, uh, catching less, less fish as a result of sewage sludge being dumped out here. So by 1993, uh, it was all stopped and, and all the sewage was then disposed on land. Okay. Um, Boston Harbor or, or Boston had a real big issue with sewage sludge, um, they, they had they had all their sewage just go right into the Boston Harbor. Um, and that made it one of the dirtiest harbors in the US. Absolutely disgusting. Okay. Um, and so what they did to uh, alleviate this problem was they built a 9.5 mile long uh, like pipe with small diffusers to let the sewage kind of 
slowly trickle out into the ocean, uh, in, basically into the, uh, sub, the, the sea floor and then kind of come out into the ocean. And that drastically improved the water quality uh, in the Boston Harbor area right here. Okay, um, so that sewage just slowly let out um, uh, into the ocean instead of just being dumped out there. So that improved the conditions in, in Boston, which is pretty bad. But it cost a, it cost a lot of money to build this uh, huge um, pipe. Okay. All right, let's move on to an, the next type of pollutant. Um, DDT is a, a pesticide, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethylene, ethane, excuse me. That's DDT. Um, and then uh, there's some industrial chemicals, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, okay? Um, they're found everywhere, guys. This is These are in the oceans. Um, we use them without any regard uh, early on. Uh, DDT kind of like in the 40s and 50s, uh, PCBs uh, during that time as well. Um, but we refer to them as persistent organic pollutants because they're still around today. We can uh, find them in Antarctic waters and in soil uh, or um, uh, ocean sediment near Antarctica as well. Uh, they're toxic, okay? Uh, they are in the oceans for a really long time. Um, DDT has a number of, uh, of really adverse effects to organisms we'll talk about in a second. And the problem is that they accumulate in the food chain, which is a problem. Okay, one of the most notable problems, and I'm sure you've heard of this, are the way that DDT affects um, the bird population's ability to create uh, uh, eggs, or essentially um, what happens is if you have DDT uh, spilling out into the oceans, um, pelicans eat the fish, and the fish are swimming through the, the uh, contaminated waters or, the, or and eating the zooplankton and smaller fish that are around the DDT. So it kind of bioaccumulates, and the concentrations increase uh, in these uh, marine seabirds. And what happens is when they lay their eggs, Bloop, right? Um, their eggshells uh, don't have a lot of calcium because that calcium is being replaced by DDT and they're too thin so their embryos don't survive. So what ended up happening is that um, the populations didn't really replenish with new generations because of these very thin eggshells. So we saw a huge decline in bird populations and it really threatened the bald eagle. Okay, uh, so along with the California brown pelican, the bald eagle was um, uh, was stressed because of this, and, and DDT was a widely used um, insecticide, just kind of poured all over crops, which uh, which for farmers they liked it because it increased their production. But uh, slowly, people began to realize um, that it started <laughs> killing a lot of organisms, and that would have an adverse effect on the environment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> DDT was banned in 1972 with the uh, Clean Water and Clean Air Act that was passed, and that was in large part due to um, uh, Silent Spring. Okay, that was a book that was published, written by uh, Rachel. Oh God, I forgot her name. Um, but Silent Spring is a book that talks about uh, the use of DDT and how it affected bird populations. Um, Rachel Carson. Okay, um, and that was really like a, a paradigm shift and at the beginning of environmentalism and then kind of understanding uh, that these chemicals and, and that we're kind of using for industrial purposes or agriculture could have an effect on our, on our environment. Um, so yeah, PCBs, those are, um, were used as uh, coolants, liquid coolants for refrigerators, um, and there were also uh, insulators and also in uh, power transformers. Um, <clears throat> we also use them in paints, caulking, uh, some hydraulic oils, uh, and they're pretty bad. They affect our reproductive um, uh, ability, uh, abilities or just, they kind of reduce the reproductive rates. They cause harmful genetic mutations. Um, so if, in, if, they're, if you're exposed to them for a long enough period of time and in high enough concentrations, um, you see really adverse effects uh, to them, okay? So most of these chemicals, DDT, are banned by most countries, uh, but not all of them, okay? So they sink to the seafloor bottom and we can find them almost everywhere. So they're pervasive. 
So we even find them in Antarctica. All right, so that's that's pretty bad. But we've banned them here in the U.S., which is a good thing. Okay. All right, the next uh, major pollutant we'll talk about is mercury. Mercury is a, a, a metal that is found, uh, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It occurs naturally from uh, erosion of certain rocks that have mercury in them. Um, but in large part, it's in the environment because uh, mercury is found in coal. So when we burn coal, oftentimes it's burned into the environment. Okay, and so, <clears throat> uh, so it's basically ubiquitous in the environment, environment and sediment and, and in organisms. And you and I, we all have mercury in our bodies. Um, but one uh, really particularly sad case was uh, in the 40s, 1940s in, um, in Japan, uh, there was a, an industrial power plant, uh, not a power plant, but a, an industrial plant that would use mercury as one of the, you know, the process of creating another chemical. And it had a lot of mercury as, as, a, as a waste product. And so they would just dump that into the bay. Okay. Um, and it was in Minamata, Minamata Bay. Okay. So they released a lot of mercury in the late 30s. Okay. Um, and what ended up happening is the organisms in that bay started to uh, kind of ingest uh, algae and zooplankton and small fish. And then larger fish started eating those smaller fish. And mercury started accumulating in the tissues of these organisms. And by the 1950s, there started to be really awful effects on the human populations or the Japanese people that lived in Minamata Bay. Um, it, an exposure to mercury in high concentrations caused neurological effects, um, involuntary muscle twitching, uh, and it affects the, the development of fetuses and um, Ch children can be born with r really problematic uh, mental deficiencies and muscular uh, deficiencies and neurological deficiencies. Okay, here you can see uh, a child that was born with uh, severe um, minimata disease. Okay, so it's really a, a neurological disorder. Okay, and the reason is because the, the people here in minimata, the Japanese people, they ate a lot of fish. Um, in fact, the, the fish markets there, that's the main... Uh, food in their diet, um, and so they would eat fish, you know, multiple times a day, you know, three times a day, and what happened was the uh, zooplankton in the water had really small concentrations of mercury from dumping from that uh, from that plant. Then the zooplankton uh, were eaten by the small fish, and as this happened, uh, one small fish will eat many zooplankton. So as they eat you know, hundreds or thousands of little tiny uh, uh, organisms, uh, the concentration of mercury increases. Uh, and then as these small fish are eaten by larger fish, like tuna or any other predatory fish, um, they eat many of these fish that have higher concentrations of mercury, so it accumulates and increases in concentration. So large fish, which uh, people would eat, or let's say osprey would eat these fish multiple times a day, um, their concentrations of mercury would increase, okay? Um, we call this bioaccumulation, all right, and biomagnification. So the further up you are on the food chain, the higher uh, concentration of mercury are in those uh, organisms as a result of eating many organisms that have been exposed to that pollutant, okay? So we've determined safe levels of mercury by uh, comparing the, the amount of fish consumption and also the mercury concentration in those fish, okay? And also, what's the minimum amount of mercury we can eat to cause the least amount of damage, okay? Here's a chart to, to check that out. So, um, the, these are uh, uh, organisms that have uh, kind of high levels of mercury in them because they're kind of top predators in the ocean. So, they've bioaccumulated a lot of mercury, so swordfish and tuna. That's why um, they always give you recommendations uh, when you eat tuna. Like, let's say if you're pregnant, you can only have tuna like once every two weeks. Uh, that way, the mercury doesn't affect the um, baby that's developing in your body. Um, but here it is. So uh, the average U.S. citizen consumes about 20 grams of fish a day. Okay, and if uh, that's uh, this is considered a safe level at this area. Okay. Um, <clears throat> If you go to, uh, this is the average U.S. consumption. People in Sweden, they have a, a, 
a high fish diet. So uh, if you're eating fish uh, that's not being contaminated by a plant, that's just natural mercury that's in the oceans, that's around this level. So, so Swedish people are kind of safe eating at that, that level. And then in Japan, they eat a lot of fish, three times a day, um, or about 84 grams a day, maybe not three times a day, twice a day or so, but a lot of fish in their diet. And still, that's very safe if you're eating uh, from uh, waters that aren't contaminated with mercury, and even eating you know, top predator fish like tuna and swordfish. However, this over here is the methyl mercury concentrations in the fish itself. And in the 1950s in Japan and Minamata Bay, this was the concentration of uh, mercury in the fish. So even if you were an American only eating 20 grams of um, fish per day, this would be dangerous, okay? And if you were eating, uh, th this is the average fish consumption in Minamata. So most people there were eating over 348 grams of seafood a day they were in this extreme dangerous territory which caused that disease and a lot of people died as a result of this. Okay, And just to give it some perspective, uh, one can of tuna, like your can of tuna is about 100, 100 grams of fish. Uh, it's 100 grams of, yeah, tuna right here. Okay, let's move on to non-point source pollution. This essentially is any plastic, um, pesticides, fertilizers, road oil, trash. It's just anything where there's runoff from land and it can come from multiple sources. So there's a lot of different types of non-point source pollution. Okay, it's hard to pinpoint its origin. It's just trash that's washed down storm drains into the ocean. That's why you gotta be careful uh, with what you use. Um, sorry smokers, you guys are contributing a lot to the oceans. I know smoking is not very popular amongst the younger generation, but a lot of cigarette filters end up in the ocean, a big, almost like a quarter of non-point source pollution <laughs> are cigarettes. Um, food containers and wrappers, bottle caps and lids, plastic utensils and straws, bottles and cans, and plastic bags are a big portion of this. Others just break down of all kinds of other different plastic materials. <coughs> Excuse me, here are the ocean dumping regulations in US, US water. So um, if you're within three miles of the coast, you can't dump any of these materials. All right, it's illegal to dump any of that stuff. Um, then when you go out to 3 to 12, uh, it kind of lowers down a little bit. And once you get outside 25 miles, uh, the only thing that's illegal to dump is plastic. Okay. Um, so, yeah, when cruise ships kind of make it out into the ocean, uh, they can just, you know, oh, that's a terrible cruise ship. They can kind of dump out their sewage right down into the ocean. Yay, cruises. Okay. So the vast majority of marine debris and non-point source pollution in the ocean uh, comes from land sources and most of it's plastic. And plastic is not biodegradable, not readily biodegradable. What that means is it's forever. So every time like you grab a piece of plastic to grab a donut and you eat that donut and it's done and you throw away that piece of plastic, that's forever. <laughs> that's going to be there forever. Every time you use one of those, you know, a toothbrush and you throw away that toothbrush that's made of plastic, that's forever. Um, anytime you floss your teeth using one of those plastic flossing tips, that's forever. Um, so really we have to keep in mind uh, all the things that we use, uh, like single use plastics, those last forever in the oceans. They don't really biodegrade. Um, there's a YouTube video here. I won't, we can't watch it in this format. So uh, please watch it. It's a, um, a video of a sea turtle with a straw stuck up its nose. You can play the Sarah McLaughlin music on the background and shed a tear, but it's pretty bad. Okay, so yeah, plastics entangle in fish and marine mammals and birds. Okay, um, you've seen that, you know, like they can choke from it. Uh, plastic bags in particular kind of float around in the ocean and they can kind of sink a little bit. And a lot of times sea turtles will mistake it for jellyfish and then just take a snap at it and then choke on the bag. So, you know, that's pretty bad. And, and, you know, if you go out to any grocery store, Publix, Walmart, man, they're bagging one item per bag. The best thing to do is is uh, really uh, bring your own bags. Or if you have to use those single kind of use plastic bags, you can bring them back to Publix to recycle them. Okay.
Um, in addition to that, a lot of these plastics have uh, harmful chemicals in them, DDT and PCBs, PAHs, for example. Okay, Look at that poor mallard has to kind of wade through all that trash. Okay, so here's some examples. Here's a, a sea lion, you know, entangled by a piece of plastic that affects its growth. Okay, here's a dead seagull, um, and after it's died, they kind of go through its guts and they find all different types of pieces of plastic. Look, you can see lighters, you can see little flossers, um, you can see uh, just a bottle cap, toothbrush handles. Uh, it's pretty bad. Straws. Okay, plastics kind of made their debut in 1862. Um, they were developed by the, uh, uh, by the army early on uh, because it was a very... Um, kind of a important material. It's very cheap, lightweight, very strong and durable, um, and inexpensive to produce. So plastics were kind of like a great new material, okay? And, and what made them so great also kind of makes them uh, bad for the environment, okay? Uh, in the production of plastic, um, you have these byproducts called nurdles, these really small little circular pieces. A lot of times they use it for packing in material. Um, but they're for used for pre-production of pa plastic pellets. They're found in every ocean. Okay, they can be confused for sediment because they're kind of clear. They look like little pieces of um, quartz grains or something. But nope, that's plastic. That's what you're digging your feet in a lot of uh, <laughs> in a lot of uh, the beaches in Florida and in California, Orange County, California, for example, Southern California. 98% of the debris that's in the sand are actual nurdles that are in the water. They, and what happens is they spill off container ships and they float around in the water for a while. And that's the thing, like plastic floats. Okay. Um, what's coming out uh, in research nowadays are uh, microplastics. Is, or we're starting to kind of figure out what's going on here. And micro, microplastics are essentially any plastics that's uh, smaller than 0 0.04 uh, to 0 0.2 inches, okay, between one and five millimeters. Um, and this is material like, like can come off your clothing, like microfibers, okay? Um, if you have a shirt that's, uh, or a jacket that's waterproof, a lot of times they use plastic microfibers in them, or a shirt that's made of polyester. And every time you put that load into the, into the, well, a washer, um, those microfibers come off your clothes and they go right into the wastewater and that eventually goes into the ocean. Um, you also find these microbeads in hand cleaners. You ever see those things where like exfoliation, microbeads, don't buy those things um, because as soon as you wash your face with them, those plastic beads just go right into the drain and out into the oceans. Okay, sometimes you even see them in toothpaste. I wouldn't recommend buying those either. But this is uh, dangerous. Look, here's a vial filled with a lot of these little microbeads. The reason why it's dangerous is because marine organisms will ingest them, and they help transport a lot of those pollutants that we talked about earlier, like PAHs and stuff like that. They're eaten by fish. And guess what happens? When you eat fish, then uh, they go into your bodies. No. Right? So about 46 million um, pounds of this is released into the Pacific Ocean. Okay, which is pretty crazy. All right, um, and floating plastic on the ocean surface um, gets hit by the sun, and the sun kind of breaks it down into smaller and smaller pieces, and those smaller pieces can be ingested by fish, which when which then we ingest. So in a small kind of long about way, we're kind of po poisoning ourselves with this plastic. So marine plastic particles are, are becoming a significant source in the oceans, and it's getting really dangerous. Okay, and there are entire regions of the ocean of floating trash. Uh, the Eastern Garbage uh, Pacific Garbage Patch, which forms over here. Remember, this is the uh, clockwise uh, currents that form the North Pacific Gyre. Okay, that that picks up trash from all over the Pacific, and it accumulates in this entire area. Some estimates uh, say that it's about the size of Texas. Okay, so I don't know what Texas looks like. Oh, uh, Texas. <laughs> Okay, this is huge. It's a giant floating garbage patch, uh, which is, you know, shameful, really. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 
yeah, so plastic is, my recommendation is try to use it as least, as, as little as possible. Um, we have power in the, in the fact that we ch can choose to purchase what we want to purchase. Um, and then so try to find products that have the least amount of plastic as possible. Okay. And you can see that a, a number of companies are kind of moving towards less and less plastic, which is a good thing. All right. All right. The last type of pollution is what we refer to as biological pollution. Um, and it, essentially just invasive species, okay? Um, and there's organisms that originate elsewhere and are introduced to new environments by humans, okay? And so what happens is they outcompete and dominate the native populations. You might be familiar with this in the Everglades with uh, Burmese pythons taking over, okay? Um, so they can cause extensive damage into ecosystems. In the marine environments in California, uh, the authors are from there, so uh, there's this um, tropical seaweed that's really kind of taking over the kelp forests in this area. And in, in California, they have they have kelp forests, which are these kind of uh, uh, large algae that grow. And then they have uh, uh, sea otters that live in them, uh, sea urchins and stuff like that, a very complex ecosystem. And this tropical seaweed is kind of taking over that area and really affecting that um uh, ecosystem, and the reason is because people want to have saltwater aquariums with this easy-growing tropical seaweed, and then when they realize it's too expensive or they don't want to keep this tropical, nice aquarium, they just dump it into the the toilet or into a storm drain, and then that invasive species goes into the California waters, and that's pretty bad. Here in Florida, um, what we've been dealing with is uh, lionfish. That's an invasive species that's all over our coral reefs, which is pretty bad. In fact, you can get paid for hunting them. So if you go out snorkeling, you can take a little spear gun and, and shoot a, a lionfish because they're really detrimental to the coral reefs in Florida because they're out competing a lot of the native species there. Okay, another example is a zebra mussel. This is in the Great Lakes it invaded because it kind of latched onto uh, boats that went into the Great Lakes. It drove out the local mussels altered the ecology of the freshwater lakes and streams, and they started growing on a lot of the uh, water pipelines and industrial facilities and caused a lot of damage. So um, it's, it, invasion of non-native species is a big problem.